All right, subatomic particles. This is what we're talking about today. This right here is a neutron, very similar to a proton in terms of mass. The difference is electrical charge. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was my phone, the volume was up. I'm so sorry. Well, Mr. Parham, your phone shouldn't be on to start with, now should it? All right, um, all right where did I put that eraser? Um... Mr. Parham! Oh my God, you're not gonna believe this. It was still on, it's crazy. These phones. I, <laughs> Give me your phone. Now, I'm gonna need you and your phone out of my classroom. <laughs> oh my god. You're not gonna. It was attached to the Bluetooth on the sound system in the school. I am embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. WHAT?! What's up, corpses and Marsha Brady? My name's Matt Sidney. And I'm Sean Parham. Wow, wow, wow. We have so much to talk about. You've just joined us for another exciting episode of Movie in an Egg Roll. What did I say about snapping? Mm, you said you said don't do them. You said don't do them. Don't do the snaps. This film is one that Sean and I have been watching since we were kids, and I gotta say, it's only gotten better. This film has everything: comedy, horror, drama, and spoiler alert. George Clooney. This week's movie was Return to Horror High. Return to Horror High is a 1987 American comedy slasher film written and directed by Bill Frolic. It stars Vince Edwards, Brandon Hughes, Lori Lechen, Alex Rocco, and also George Clooney. This is pre-Clooney Clooney, like prenatal Clooney. Just an infant Clooney. This movie starts with a story that's not the story we're gonna watch, but the story about the story that's about a story about the story that's also a story. And I'm dead. That was a lot. The opening scroll of this movie tells you exactly what's about to happen, and then it just doesn't happen. Out of the gate, everyone's dead. Marsha Brady is a cop. This is their stories. If you're not sold based on what we've already told you, I'd stop watching now, because it's only gonna unravel from here. The movie centers around the filming of a horror movie about a murder in a high school. The film itself is set in that high school where the murder happened, where a fair portion of the actors are actually people involved with the murder that happened in that high school. So it's a movie, in a movie. It's a movie about a murder that's within a movie. And in that movie is the movie, which is the movie about the murder. Damn it, Leonardo DiCaprio. How do you expect to make that plan happen? We go five levels deep. <laughs> five levels? That's impossible. Impossible! Let me tell you something. What if right now, you and I were in a clip about a movie being reviewed in this movie's review about this movie, because it's about a movie where the movie is about making a movie. So This whole thing is financed by a haggard Godfather alumni. The producer of this film is a real sleazebag, very Harvey Weinstein. In fact, it, it might have been Harvey Weinstein. If it's not clear enough, he even has an assistant that brings him a cell phone in a suitcase. Classic Miramax. The movie starts with real-world cops investigating the second mass murder that happened at this school. That is to say, the film crew filming the movie about a murder was murdered. We got a full-blown Tarantino going on here. The only person that survived the new murders was one of the writers, and he is not handling it well. At all. He claims to be the writer, and he's still somewhat in shock. Mr. Lyman? Look at that mess. This is not his day, month, or year. He also narrates the entirety of the murders. You know you can trust this bag of crazy. Through the beautiful art of 80s cinematography, we are introduced to all of our characters in organized succession. It's a ragtag team of low-budget warriors fighting the good fight. They're really just trying to get this movie to happen. Also, George Clooney's there, and he immediately hits critical mass Clooney. We got a contract. 
we can sue. No, you can't. That takes money. Then George Clooney dies. That's all, folks. With Clooney gone, the film scrambles to find their new lead. Not the film we are watching, the film being made about the murders. Good Christ! Luckily, evil Steve Martin realizes the cop they are telling the story about is conveniently working on the set as a consultant. So by my count, about 50% of this production is now the real people involved with the murder. It's a documentary. And so we follow not George Clooney as he is once again unable to stop like 86 murders, if not more. These are creative murders. Rube Goldberg level murders. Get the dominoes out, people are dying. Yo, is that you, man? Hey, look, come here, you gotta check this out. This production is in disarray. Even before people were dying and being seamlessly replaced by people working for exposure, many were working several jobs just to keep this fake murder film afloat. Our leading lady, both in the film we're watching and the film they're making, is acting in three separate roles. This all hands on deck approach just aids to the confusion because when someone goes missing, someone else just jumps right in and does their job for them. More accurately, it's a low budget film, so high quality of life, work, and concept are not expected at all. It's getting hot in here. It's so hot. We come to find out that even the legitimate storylines are also convoluted tales that just get us to our denouement, where, shocker, the principal of the school, who's not an actor, but the actual principal, is the one offing all the characters that we should have been invested in. Oh, sorry, did we not talk about the berserk character of the principal? This bonkers administrator just waltzing around being a monster creep? Every character is a suspect in this thing. Everyone is strange. There is a severed head in a closet at one point, and I was convinced that that was the one carrying out the murders. Big reveal! The principal is doing these murders now because faux Clooney hooked up with the principal's daughter in the past, who was pregnant with Clooney clone's baby, which made her impure to the principal. And she died giving herself a fetus deletus. Matt wrote that. So, the principal went crazy and killed everybody, and they died happily ever after. Aww. Which will apparently drive you crazy enough to master the art of catching flies out of the air. Once you find your center, anything is possible. I understand, Master. Today, we will test your facilities. For only the truly grounded can catch a fly from flight midair. Oh, uh, oh man, you know I'm not... I'm not good at that one. That's not... I'm not good. That one's no good for me. Why not? My other student can do it. Jerry. Gosh, I guess I gotta kill more people to get these flies in my hands. Also, why are there so many flies in this room? Ah! But ser seriously? Did, did nobody... How does... How is it unclear that this man was killing people? Also, how did no one notice that the principal and the janitor are the same person? Did we not talk about the insane janitor? Who was in fact the principal? Who is of a different race and a different height and he has different voices, but somehow they're the same person? The reveal was not only shocking, but also shocking. It was shocking squared. There are more questions answered than asked in this film, and that's why we love this genre. This was an hour and a half of pure nonsense, and we wouldn't have had it any other way. This movie could serve as a wake-up call to all those who thought Scream was an oh-so-original piece. Witty lines like, Why does everyone always want to go to a dark basement without even a flashlight? Commenting on the oldest horror cliches pop up here ten whole years before they become fashionable. This film just adds one bizarre twist after another in the last 30 minutes. And it honestly just doesn't make a lot of sense. But in that respect, it's worthy of our respect. 
In general, this film offers a lot more creativity than you would normally find in the genre. Harpoon threw a man's heart into a concrete wall. We're gonna come up with a rating system based on the movie, and this week we're gonna do a rating system of George Clooney's bloody face pushed on a window. Was that in the movie? It definitely happened. How many bloody George Clooney's are you gonna give this movie, Sean? I'm gonna give this movie solid three George Clooney bloody faces. I I think I'm giving this a lot of points because of nostalgia, because Matt and I grew up watching this movie like all the time. It was this movie and The Faculty, which I promise we will get to. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty great for the genre. It's funny. Marsha Brady's in it. She covers her boobs in blood at one point, so that's a big plus. I loved it. Practical effects are always great. And the main villain had uh, yellow gloves on his hand the whole time. And that made me feel a little tight in my trousers. I'm gonna give this movie a solid four pressed Clooney faces. And honestly, yeah, I'm biased. There's a bunch of nostalgia to it. I've been watching the movie since I was a kid, and it is my introduction to the B-movie genre. And for that, I just have to thank the film. And I wouldn't be doing this with my buddy Sean if it wasn't for a movie like this. So, four press movies. Guys... <laughs> this fucking chicken! Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate it like you don't believe. Like our videos, subscribe to our channel, and hit... Don't forget to like and subscribe, hit the notification bell so you'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll always find out when new content comes out from the 21st floor. And if you have any suggestions for movies, TV, dance performances, YouTube videos you want us to react to, put it in the comment section below and we'll make a video for you specifically. So, Kevin, thank you so much for tuning in.